before we go ahead I would like first of all just like I did last time that you agree with me on certain presuppositions so we are on the same kind of playing field here so I don't get kind of surprised that somebody doesn't believe what I'm going to present okay so let us just take a take a look at a couple of fundamental truths okay whether we're comfortable with those truths the first one would be sola scriptura prima scriptura tota scriptura what it means sola you know what it means prima means scripture first always first for Adventists it's very important because we have other prophetic writings and tota means the whole scripture okay that that you don't leave out some books because you don't like them okay are you fine with this okay very good okay so so it looks like everybody is okay with this are you okay with Adventist fundamental number one you fine with it do you like it okay that this is the Holy Scriptures we don't we're not, not going to read it but is this okay you okay to agree with this do I have your agreement okay uh, this is the reason be why I'm asking those questions the third one will be scripture above reason what would you say should we uh, when when you've got scripture and reason what comes first scripture, scripture right so so you fine with this okay very good so uh, could we say that the only rule and judgment should be the written word of god right as a believers we should know nothing of the inch this is from past century intuition of reason or the deductions of philosophy except those reproduced by sacred canons canon so if it's in the bible it's fine if it's not in the bible no right so we take bible okay i don't think you should have much problems with this although remember this sa okay later on I say Jesus another big word this is the last big word I say Jesus is when you read into the Bible it's not what exegesis is you what you get out of the Bible the go to Greek and try to find out words I say Jesus is you read your things into the Bible we say no to this okay so th this is the thing it's not the best practice to go to the Bible with preconceived ideas and then to try prove your point of view on the basis of isolated passages from the Bible is it true okay are you, you happy with this okay so for example Jesus says cut off your arm and you make a theology all people who come to church need to cut off their arms if they do something wrong right so so this is kind of I said Jesus example of I said Jesus so you fine with those fundamental proofs uh, the truths I think so okay so I would like to take you now on a journey the journey will take us back and this is quite quite an interesting place to actually uh, undertake the journey in this so i have to be very careful uh, i would like to revisit an issue that divided once divided the american society deeply very deeply i'm not american so i'm kind of a standing outside of this whole thing but uh, i recently some time ago found documents which i found absolutely fascinating that really fascinated me and they were thoroughly biblical and that's what I would like to share with you today I would like to present to you biblical foundations for the practice of slavery uh, as I read the Bible slavery appears to be biblically supported institution where you carefully read the Bible for a per person who just takes the Bible okay don't get angry at me it's alright uh, for a person who just reads the Bible opens the Bible cannot really escape from the conclusion that slavery is taught by the Bible if you are a true Christian and if you believe that the Bible is a revelation of God it's almost inescapable that you have to arrive at that conclusion so on the basis of this we could say that abolitionist cause the, the abolitionists were those who were against slavery was appears to be based on human philosophy and not on the Bible uh, the fact that we have no slavery today uh, is just simply because of shifting cultural situation, cultural conditions, uh, and not necessarily on the testimony of the scripture. So thanks to that we have no slavery today, uh, it's basically culture rejected slavery. So if you go to any big city, stop any person, or make a survey out of thousand people, you'll find out that virtually everybody will be against slavery, right? Uh, but is it on the basis of the Bible? Well, that's, uh, that is uh, debatable. Therefore, in 1861, John Thornwell, he was a Presbyterian minister, he wrote this, Opposition to slavery has never been the offspring of the Bible. 
Then he says, the parties in this conflict are not merely abolitionists and slaveholders, they are atheists, socialists, communists, red republicans, Jacobins on one side and the friends of order and regulated freedom on the other. In one word, the world is the battleground, Christianity and atheism, the combatants and progress of humanity at stake. So who is the Christianity here in this quote? Those in favor of slavery. Who are the atheists in this quote? Abolitionist, okay? He's the Presbyterian minister, very famous Presbyterian minister. In other words, what his point of view would be that you either agree with biblical teaching that slavery is sin or be charged with unfaithfulness to the Bible. Because the Bible, he would say, shows that slavery was a divine institution. Just read the story of Noah. Uh, that Noah had one son who was subjected to slavery because of what he did. So let us look at some uh, selected passages. This is just a selection here uh, of the biblical evidence. So let us look at the Old Testament. Uh, you will find in Old Testament that Abraham owned slaves and was never condemned for this practice. So it is clear from the text, from the Hebrew text, you will find out that he did have slaves real slaves, okay? But he was the man of faith. God never condemns Abraham for owning slaves. The Ten Commandments, okay? If you read them carefully, you will find out that in the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment regulates a day of rest for slaves. Everybody needs to be, uh, have rest in your house, including slaves. And the Tenth Commandment is even more explicit. You should not covet someone else's slaves. You should not do that, okay? Because it's wrong, it's against commandment of God. So, so, so you know, the Ten Commandments obviously teach us that, uh, not that it doesn't condemn the Tenth and Fourth, they don't condemn slavery, they actually regulate slavery. Therefore, it's not surprising that the Jewish rabbi, uh, M.J. Raphael, uh, in 1861, he wrote this, listen carefully. The Tenth Commandment places slaves under the same protection as any other species of lawful property. That the Ten Commandments are the Word of God and as much of the very highest authorities acknowledged by Christians as well as by Jews. How dare you, he speaks to abolitionists, how dare you in the face of the sanction and protection afforded to slave property in the Ten Commandments, how dare you to denounce slaveholding as a sin? When you remember that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Job, the men with whom the Almighty conversed, with whose names he emphatically connects his own most holy name, and to whom he vouchsafed to give the character of perfect, upright, fearing God and eschewing evil, that all these men were slaveholders, does it not strike you that you are guilty of something very little short of blasphemy? So this is a Jewish rabbi responding to uh, the issue, the slave issue in the commandments. Leviticus 25, 39, 46. This is an interesting passage. You will find that uh, it talks about uh, selling, if fellow Israelis become poor, they can sell themselves, and, and, and so on, kind of regulates. But this verse 44 is very interesting. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of the clan, clans born in your country. And they will become your property. You can bequeath them to your children and as inherited property and can make them slaves for life, but you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. So notice one thing. There's no condemnation here of slavery. It's a regulation of slavery. And here you, you should not make the Israelites slaves, but you can make nations around, you can buy slaves, but you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. The implication is that you can, wear, you can rule ruthlessly over those people from other nations. But then we can go further. We go to the New Testament. This is once again a sample of evidence. Jesus does not condemn slavery. You never once you find him condemning slavery, ever once. In Matthew 8, 9, you will find that the centurion is not condemned for having a slave. For I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me, and go and, and so on. And, and Jesus never condemns centurion that he has a slave. He had a real authentic slave. Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such, such faith. And the guy is a slave owner. 
uh, in parables, Jesus often used the illustration of, uh, uh, of masters and slaves. Okay, in Luke 17, 7, you've got the whole parable of masters and slaves. Suppose one of you has a slave, doulos, that's a real slave, plowing or looking after the sheep, and, and so on. So Jesus was using, illustri illustrating, in his parables, he was illustrating his speech with stuff from real life. Not once he condemned slavery. Okay, how about other New Testament uh, evidences? The apostles did not condemn slavery either. You will find the foundational principle in the writings of Paul, how he believed life should be organized in 1 Corinthians 7.17. 7, and this is what he says, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned him or her and to which God has called him or her. So, so Paul says, okay, if, you, uh, if you're a slave and he's coming back to slavery in a moment, just retain that position. You should, you should, be, you should keep your position as you are. So then later on he says, for we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body where the Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we serve all given the one spirit to drink. And we were all given the one spirit. So this is spiritual equality, okay? So the, the verse also is reproduced in Galatians 3.28. There's no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female, no slave or free. This has apparently nothing to do with uh, social position. This has to do with spiritual equality, that we are all have uh, access to salvation, okay? And then you have Ephesians 6, 5 to 9, and repeated in Colossians 3, 22 to 25. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as you are serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he's slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. So here we don't have condemnation of slavery, as we would expect. But there's no condemnation. But Paul actually regulates the slavery. Just be nice to each other. And the slave obey the masters. And then we've got 1 Timothy 6.1. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Just notice this. May not be slandered. We'll come back to this. Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These things you are to teach and urge on them. So this was like Paul really using his authority to, to you need to just make sure that our gospel is not slandered, okay? Just show respect to your, uh, to your masters because otherwise there will be problems, okay? So here's a Paul uh, teaching us, teaching the, those who will read his letters that slavery is okay. Just, just, you can Treat each other better. Titus 2.9 Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they are fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. So slaves subject to their masters, teach them, Titus, okay, not to steal, so the teaching of Savior will be attractive. This is an interesting thing here, that, that Paul would say such a thing. In order to be, for the gospel to be attractive, slaves need to obey their masters. Whoa! And then you've got Philemon situation, where Paul acknowledged the owner's rights. Okay? He sends back the Philemon and says, well, treat him nice because he's a brother uh, in Christ, but uh, Onesimus, treat him nice, but he doesn't dissolve. Paul does not speak down. He's no longer a slave. He is still a slave, but treat him nicely. Okay? So in Peter, we find the same thing. Uh, 1 Peter 2.18 Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters. This is that Peter here who is speaking to John, asking, asking him, this is Leonardo da Vinci picture, asking him, ask Jesus, who is the one who is going to betray you? So this is the Peter here. Slaves, submit yourself to masters with all respect, not only to whom you are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. So when I open the Bible, okay, when, the, when I, I read it plainly, open the Bible, I actually find this kind of stuff. What would be my conclusion? Okay, what the conclusion would be, if you just open the Bible, simply conclusion would be 
that scripture regulates slavery but does not condemn it. That's one conclusion. Another one, that apostolic practice does not contradict the law of Moses. So what you had in Old Testament is repeated by the law of, Mo of Moses. What, uh, it's repeated, what is the law of Moses is repeated by the apostles. So another conclusion, within Christian homes in the New Testament, slaves enjoyed special privileges, but the owner-slave relationship was not dissolved. That relationship was not dissolved okay, in New Testament. So that's what you get. So this is not surprising, therefore, that in 64, 1864, Episcopal minister, as you see him on the picture, Henry Hopkins, would write this, uh, this statement. The teachings of Scripture on the matter of slavery are what? Plain. Who are we that in our modern wisdom presume to set aside the word of God and to invent for ourselves a higher law that those holy scriptures which are given to us as a light to our feet and a lamp to our paths in the darkness of a sinful and polluted world. So you have a, you have a situation here where he says teachings are plain on slavery. Who are we to invent a new law? Okay, it's very plain. It's clear to us. Another guy, Richard Furman, a Baptist minister, would write this. Had the holding of slaves been a moral evil, listen carefully, had the holding of slaves been a moral evil, it cannot be supposed that the inspired apostles who feared not the faces of men and were ready to lay down their lives in the cause of their God would have tolerated for a moment in the Christian church. Okay, so obviously he believes that if apostles thought that slavery was wrong, morally wrong, they would have said so. They would never say no to that this is okay, but obviously they didn't, this must be okay. So Charles Hodge, he's a famous, was a famous theologian of Princeton School, very famous theologian. Uh, he started the movement called fundamentalism. Okay? Uh, the abolitionist cause is based on mere impulses of feeling and a blind imitation of what? Cultural trends. If the present course of the abolitionist is right, then the course of Christ and the apostles is wrong. Okay, so this is a famous theologian who, who says that, uh, that uh, if, if abolitionists are right, then Christ is wrong and we can't read the Bible anymore because teaching on, is plain that abolitionism is wrong. Okay, so Robert Dabney, another gentleman living uh, at that time, he wrote this. Here is our policy then, to push the Bible argument continually, to drive abolitionism to the wall, to compel it to assume an anti-Christian position. By doing so, we compel the whole Christianity of the North to array itself on our side. So what are, get, what are they going to use to prove to the North that slavery is okay? They're going to use the Bible. They're going to use the Bible. John Bell Robinson wrote this. The teachings of both the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures are so plain, righteous, consistent and palpable that I cannot exercise a sufficient stretch of charity towards such men, abolitionists, to believe them sincere. But infidelity is the bottom of the whole scheme of abolitionism. Those who do not understand such plain teachings are not fit for the gospel of ministry and should be silenced for their ignorance. So what is he saying is, the Bible is so plain that if you are a pastor and you are an abolitionist, you are not fit for the gospel ministry and should be silenced for your ignorance. That's quite strong words, don't you think? So no wonder that Let's things like this happen. Just again. Let me put it again. It died. I pulled it somewhere. I want you to listen to this. <sighs> just, I was just kidding. Is it plugged? Yeah, yeah. No, okay. It's plugged in there. Okay, try it now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, 
Sorry, folks. That's okay. Yeah. What's happening? Yes, oh, okay. Must be this cord. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. I will play it from your computer. I will play it from my computer. Just listen carefully. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Did you hear that? Stripes. That nigga that don't obey his Lord, that's his master, do you see? That there nigga shall be beaten with many stripes. Now many signifies a great many. Forty, a hundred, a hundred and fifty lashes. That's scripture. So you saw what happened. Okay. That clip, okay, I can just not go to an analysis here. That clips come from a book from this is a this was a movie made 12 years a slave. It was written by Solomon Northup, who was a northerner, a free black man, and he was kidnapped. One day he was taken to uh, he was taken to a tavern and his drink was spiked and he was taken by he had a wife and family he was taken into slavery into the south and he disappeared for 12 years uh, i didn't bring the book with myself because i didn't uh, i didn't know that i'll be teaching on this but those words that you just heard are exactly what he remembers in this way when you look at the big picture you look those those passages here god would be against slavery because you see god is love don't do to others to uh, what you don't want them to do to you and so on and you look at this whole picture and, and and it goes back and forth between between the reading of the scripture which purifies your presuppositions and then with pure more pure presupposition you read the scripture and you arrive and the new understanding under the guidance of the holy spirit and eventually the christianity embraced the whole idea that slavery is wrong okay and we don't have many people who would believe this kind of reading of the scripture anymore so i have a question here okay uh, when we think of the issue of women in ministry when we discuss these issues what kind of let's say people who strongly oppose women in ministry or the nation of women which hermeneutic would they use okay you see it's kind of like it comes into into this way people who actually would like to see women in ministry which hermeneutic are they going to use they're going to use this hermeneutic okay so this is this is the problem that we are facing in our church in our church we do not face a problem on the level of the scripture I don't think this is my assessment on the level of the Bible we face the problem on the level of our presuppositions the war about ordination is a presuppositional war okay that's why uh, one person can read the same verse and come up with this conclusions the other person can leave the, read the same verse and come up with this conclusion one person will read the Bible and say God is for slavery other person will read the same verse and they will say no 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 God is against the slavery same verse same Bible okay different presuppositional base and this is what we often do not understand as, as Adventists, that, that we need to 
continually be asking God. I'm not saying that my presuppositions are correct and somebody else's presuppositions are wrong. I'm not, like for example, in the issue of women's ordination, uh, I disagree with the presuppositions of the people who disagree with women in ministry, but they disagree with mine, but this is not on the basis of the scripture. It's on the basis of what we already bring into the scripture. So the, the issue of slavery in the in the uh, early uh, American history, it was basically similar to the issue that we are facing today in our church. It's a presuppositional war that we're facing. We approach the Bible with different software right here. And I think to achieve the unity, God asks us to understand somebody else's software, understand my own software. I, I need to pray to God, and I do have that prayer actually. God, please reveal to me what are my presuppositions? Where am I reading the Bible wrong? Please tell me, okay? And this is a continual struggle and continual tr attempt to, uh, to come as close to the message of, of the Bible as possible. Okay? So, so this, is, uh, this is basically uh, the, f the first... Uh, uh, what I wanted to tell you this, okay? Uh, none of us is consistent hermeneutically. Okay, and when we approach the Bible, depending on what we experience here, we tend to switch hermeneutics. Okay, like when you say, God, Jesus said, if your uh, eye is, um, what's the thing, if your eye is um, uh, not evil, but uh, if, I've got the Polish word, it's difficult to translate. Um, uh, no, when he talked about cutting hands and. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, but why? If it offends you something, pluck it, pluck it out. So n there's nobody who reads it like this, right? Because you'll be blind, <laughs> you know, if you read it like this. You read it like this. You try to find the principle behind what Jesus is saying, okay? So you're reading it in this way. But many of us, when it comes to women in ministry, we go into this kind of reading, right there. So uh, in one passage, and I will demonstrate it to you, in one passage of the Bible, we actually use both, jump between hermeneutics all the time. And this is the passage of uh, 1 Timothy. Okay, and it's, it's a very interesting, interesting thing what's happening here. So uh, 1 Timothy and chapter 2. Okay, so let me just, just, just briefly say this. He says this. In verse 8, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer, without anger and disputing. Okay, did you see any raising hands today in the church? No, no, we said, okay, raising hands is obviously not quite, it's here. Okay, I also want women to dress modestly with distance and propriety. It's here. Okay, uh, so, but with, um, uh, uh, with uh, not with braided hair. Oh, I saw some braided hair today. We might, must be reading the Bible here in this way, okay? Uh, and then pearl, without pearl, expensive clothes here, okay? Appropriate for women to prefer. A woman should learn in quietness, full submission. I do not permit, oh, it's all here. I have authority, she must be silent and so on. And then says, but women will be safe through childbearing. Oh, this is here. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you see, in one passage, we kind of go back and forth. And this is where we disagree. Because some people will stay here and some people will stay here and we begin to fight. So, so a problem that we face as a church, I call it kangaroo hermeneutics. That we tend to just jump. We don't do hermeneutics consistently. You know, as, as Adventists, we've done very good confessional hermeneutics, but we have not done good cultural hermeneutics. And, and how this actually impacts us. So we cannot avoid this. This is us. We need to ask God to purify us, to help us think through so that our presuppositions are purified on the basis of Scripture. And then we can come close and close and close to the discovery who God really is is. Okay, so this is a first presentation in the series, and so I'll just move on straight away to the second one, okay? You, you're all in pretty much engaged, so you're not falling asleep, so this is good, okay? But is this, is this kind of, does it make sense? All right, very often we don't know we have this, we, we're not aware of this, but, but we grew up like this, okay? Yes? My daughter met her today she has a little boy he's two three and he has a friend Easton Heilman who is also three 
out on these buildings are numbers. And their mother came up on them one day when these two three-year-olds were looking at the number 12. My grandson said, it's number one. His little friend said, no, it's number two. My grandson, no, it's number one. No, it's number two. And their mother came along and said, no, boys, this is number 12. <laughs> yes, that's right. And enlightened them. And that's what I hear you saying. That's that it. The church is arguing over one and two. And I am anxious for the day when the Holy Spirit says, this is number 12. Exactly. Isn't it great illustration here? This is, this is wonderful. That we, both sides, you see, uh, let, let me come back to this situation here. We've got a division in the church. Group says we should not ordain women. The other group says we should ordain women. And we've got this fight, fight between those two groups, okay? And I believe both groups are wrong. Okay, both groups are wrong. Okay, one, because one group does not want to ordain women and the other group wants to ordain women on the same faulty reasoning. Yes. One group does not want to have women authority over men. The other group wants women to have authority over men. Yes. And, and this is the same basic flaw of reasoning. And I say wrong understanding of authority as I showed you in my previous presentation. We need to look at the bigger picture, who God is, what love means, and then we will be able to solve the problem, seeing 12 rather than 1 and 2. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, let me just go into to second, the second presentation. So, it's a little bit of hermeneutics of culture. This is only number one out of four lectures. We're only going to do number one, and that's enough today. So, another half an hour or so. So, what is culture? Tell me what is culture. What is culture? Collective experience. Pardon? Collective experience. Collective experience, kind of. Okay. I've got a definition of culture here. The totality of socially transmitted behavior. Patterns, arts, belief, institutions, and all other products of human work and thought. Right? Culture? That's what we could call culture. This is related to all of this that we're talking about. I've got a second question. Is the concept of culture good or bad? Both. Hmm? Both. Yeah, it's kind of, so when you say both, it means it's neutral. Okay, so it could be bad, could be good, and so on. But the culture is just it. It's a culture, right? <laughs> it's a culture. I have a culture, okay? I'm Polish, Australian culture. That's my culture, okay? I grew up in Poland. Uh, my culture is kind of weird because I went to Poland. I don't feel to totally Polish. I'm in Australia. I don't feel totally Australian. So I'm kind of a mixture of Polish, Australian. My culture is unique and I'm proud of it. But <laughs> anyway, th this is just a culture, you know? Culture is culture, okay? If, of course, everything is tainted by sin, okay? But generally speaking, culture is like music. Is music bad or good? Mm -hmm. right. Music is music, right? And can be bad and can be good, okay? But generally speaking, it's music, okay? So, next question. Is God's revelation acultural? That means not speaking to culture. Now think about it. Does God speak like, uh, say that God uh, speaks to Abraham and he's thinking about us or, or something, uh, let, let, or let's say he writes to the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not drive expensive cars, type of thing, you know. Is God speaking to Moses or he's speaking to us? Primarily. No, primarily he's speaking to a culture, okay? That's what, that's what I mean. Revelation is always cultural. That means if it wasn't cultural, then people would not understand what God is speaking about. Okay, so, so when we have commandments, we kind of reinterpret them a, a little bit because we don't have slaves anymore. So we have to reinterpret them for our culture. Okay, there's great principle behind, but, but we inter God always speaks to specific culture. Uh, so revelation is always cultural. So that means that in other cultures it has to be interpreted, right? Uh, how should Christians respond to changes in culture? What do you think? How should we respond to, uh, should I go, or maybe we should go this, should I go with my culture or should I go against my culture? What do you think? 
Should I go against or with my culture? Sometimes against and sometimes for, okay? Sometimes culture, cultural changes are good, sometimes cultural changes are bad. This is a cultural change that was good, right? Against slavery. This is a good cultural change, so absolutely. So how should I as a Christian respond to changes in culture? I cannot say Christ or culture, like some people are trying to say, because it's impossible. Okay, because in culture you've got elements that are good and you've got elements that are bad. You cannot just take it and dump it because they, then you become nobody. Because everybody has a culture of sorts, okay? Just like everybody had presuppositions here, the same thing. So how should I, this is the problem, this is a big issue, how should I respond as a Christian? I'll give you an illustration now, okay, uh, that I re read some time ago in uh, one of the magazines. The change, change attitudes towards interracial marriage. Okay, so in 1958, 4% of American population, they were okay with interracial marriage. Okay, 4%. In 1973, look at this. 29% of population were okay with interracial marriage. 1997, we've got 51%. In 2011, watch this. 86% of American population are okay with, uh, uh, with interracial marriage. It probably will be higher now because we've got 2017. But think about there's still 14% of people who disagree that, that there should be any form of interracial marriage. Now I have a question for you. Okay, so this is trend up. Is it right or wrong? Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, uh, I mean, it's not wrong, okay? I mean, why would it be wrong in some way? But this change, notice what, this change was driven not by the Bible. The, the people who oppose mostly, they would use the Bible to oppose it. The most fundamentalist people, they would use the Bible to oppose the interracial marriage. Okay, so this change was driven by the culture. So obviously, not everything that culture does is necessarily wrong. Just like not this ch cultural change in America, like I told you, nobody in America, in my opinion, sane person, there are some insane people that I met, but a sane person would never say that slavery is okay. And it's a cultural change. There are atheists today who say that slavery is wrong, right? So not everything is necessarily wrong that is cultural. So what is the point of all of this? On the one hand, Christians should challenge those aspects of culture and cultural changes that are clearly against biblical values. There's no questions about it. If there is something in the Bible that is absolutely clear, the spirit of the Bible, just say no. This is, this is not negotiable. An example here for us would be the issue of, uh, uh, say, acceptance of homosexual marriage in the, uh, in the church. You never have a permission in the Bible to go that direction. Not even once you have a permission to, to go that direction. So, so for us as conservative Adventist Christians who treat the Bible seriously, we will never as a church embrace homosexual marriage. It just cannot happen. It's, it's impossible because the Bible is very clear, clear on that. On the other hand, Christians should embrace those aspects of culture and cultural changes that are not against biblical values. Wouldn't you agree? Sometimes culture is faster than Christianity. <laughs> you know, sometimes it took a long time for many Christians in the South to reject this kind of hermeneutics where cultural changes were quite big. Uh, it took a long time, okay? So, so we have this problem of cultures. We have changes that are definitely wrong. The push for, for the homosexual marriage and so on is absolutely wrong, okay? So we as a church will never accept it. We have to say no. But there are aspects of cultural changes that are not against biblical values. So we need to relook at those things. So, okay, last question. How can we distinguish between what is cultural and what is transcultural in the Bible? In other words, how can we distinguish? So here I come to 1 Corinthians 11, and I, and I, and I read quite strong verses in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, that women should 
every woman who prays or prophesies and with her head uncovered dishonors her head. All right, how am I supposed to interpret this? Every woman who prays should have her covered. How are you going to interpret this? Is it cultural or transcultural? Transcultural means that applying forever. Cultural means applying to given culture. What do you think? The covering of the head. Do you see? I don't see any woman here covering her head. Do you know that you oppose the plain reading of the Bible? The plain reading says that you should actually wear covering. But you apply this kind of thing here, okay? You've got experience, culture, bringing education. You notice that all the women in Western culture don't wear head coverings. If, they, if those women who are covered like Muslims, it's kind of like different. But all women don't. You grew up, you got the idea here, and you read this, this verse. It's okay, this was applicable to their culture. It's not applicable to us anymore. Therefore, women do not wear head coverings. But they are Christian bodies that you will see like Mennonites or Amish women that will wear because they take this literally. They believe it is transcultural. And I know Adventist women who actually wear head coverings. Okay, I, I know women who wear head coverings because of that very reason. A friend of mine wears head covering because she's convicted that God tells her that she needs to wear on the basis of this verse. So you see, there is, a, there is a kind of a difference right here. You have a problem. How do we distinguish? How do I know that head covering for a woman is just cultural and not, and not something that God wants us for all eternity, for, for, I mean, until we're here on this earth? How do I know this? Okay? So here's the issue, and we don't have much time to talk about that, but... Uh, most Christians will agree that in the Bible we find both cultural and transcultural material. That means we've got material that is applicable to specific cultures, but we've got material in the Bible that is applicable to all cultures, to us today. Whatever we buy, bye bye, clever. I'll be in touch. Okay, so in the Bible we find this both kind of material, but most Christians disagree. Where do we draw the line between cultural and transcultural material? This is our Adventist problem right here. Okay, you see that line? This is where we argue, like in the issue of women's ordination. Some people will say that when Paul said that women shall have no authority over men, this is a transcultural. Other people will say, no, this is cultural. Okay, and, and, and then we've got this line going here on the basis of these presuppositions that we have talked about here, and then we fight. Then we disagree as Christians. And, and our war is on the basis of our preconceived ideas. So, let me just... Um, uh, go on. We must recognize that in some instances the Bible itself does not allow us to go beyond the text. I believe that uh, the Bible does not allow us to allegorize the creation, for example. I believe in six-day creation because the Bible itself does not allow us to do that. Jesus was talking about creation and apostles were talking about creation, so this is, this is a transcultural cultural issue. The principles in the Ten Commandments, we observe Sabbath today because God gave Ten Commandments. This is transcultural. Okay? Marriage between, between a woman and a man. It was established in the Garden of Eden. Okay, the very beginning, it's an issue that applies throughout the cultures. There's not a marriage between men and men and woman and woman. It's just, just a marriage between men and a, and, and a woman. It's a transcultural issue. Okay, but in, some other, in other instances, the Bible does allow us to go beyond the text. Okay, so here you would have interesting situation. Where would the Bible allow us to go beyond the text? Okay, yes, the Bible has some strong sentences against women's participation in worship service, but the Bible also has some other instances where clearly women participated and were in leadership position. And I could document it to you that, for example, Phoebe, she was diaconos and she was a leader in the church. It's in the text. There were women who spoke. There were women who instructed uh, people. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, okay, uh, they both taught Apollos. 
And the funny part is, Priscilla, when they, they, they put together as a couple, Priscilla is often put first. It's Priscilla and Aquila. And in, in code language, means that she was a better Bible teacher. Okay, this is a code, biblical code. If she was second, it would be different. But, but she's listed first, so that means she was teaching. Then, then Paul is speaking about women prophesying and publicly uh, speaking. So the verse, for example, that women should be silent in the church. Okay, we've got on one hand Paul says this, but on the other hand he says this. So obviously there are exceptions. When you find exceptions in the scripture, then you can assume that this was applying for the culture for the particular culture. Like women were speaking in the Bible. They were not silent in the Bible. And yet Paul says women shall be silent. Okay, so what's what going on? So we, can, we don't have Paul to ask, but obviously this was cultural. And today, try to apply this women shall be silent in the church in Adventist church. That would just kill our church. Okay, women are a vital part of, of ministry in the church. So sometimes the Bible allows us, sometimes it doesn't allow us to go uh, further. Which is which? Okay, it's a big issue. So let me just tell you about ethical movements in the Bible and then we'll finish up with Ellen White. So the Bible, the God presents his revelation into a specific culture that has its specific ethics. Okay, specific way of, of behavior. So I've got the letters here. This is C, original culture and ethics, B, biblical ethics, and A, ultimate ethics. So here we have, uh, in the Bible we have a movement from what I like to call from bad to best, but not always, okay? So then the best is B and A, biblical ethics is ultimate ethics, okay? So we've got ten commandments there, we've got marriage in there, the Bible teaches, teaches marriage, marriage and so on. But there are situations, okay, so do all teachings of the Bible represent the movement from bad to best, that everything that is in the Bible is ultimate ethics? And the answer is no, because we have got example of slavery. So let me show you this, okay. This is a two people who read the Bible. Okay, they, but they, they live in different worlds, diff separated by 2,000 uh, years of history. Okay, and a young man here, he's a 21st century man, he opens the Bible and reads about slaves obey their masters. Slaves, you need to be subject to your masters. And this guy is thinking, this is crazy. The Bible is a book that is just, I need to dismiss it because it does not apply to my world at all. I need to just close it and toss it out. But when the same guy who is a slave, he reads the Bible, what he finds in the Bible? He finds, masters, treat your slaves well. Okay, you need to be Christian masters especially, you need to be good to your slaves, you need to treat them well. You need to so you see something that this guy is reading the Bible and is thinking, wow, this is great, this is absolutely wonderful, this is good news, this is this is fantastic. Okay, so look at the different reactions. They approach the Bible with, with a different set of things. For one guy it is rest redemptive, for other guy it is restrictive. So what do we have here? The Bible, from original culture, raises a standard. Okay, it takes us, take, we're almost done, so, uh, so hang on for, for three minutes with me here. Okay, biblical ethics is the, not the ultimate ethics, okay? So, but the Bible gives some viruses as far as slavery, and those viruses are all those that we, we got here, the Galatians 3.28, Golden Rule, Israel is set free. And eventually, eventually, we reach a better kind of ethics, ultimate ethics with no slavery. So, original culture, slavery is okay. Bible brings it, okay, slavery, we won't fight against slavery, but there are different kind of relationships. Now, masters, be nice to your slaves. Slaves, honor your masters so that God's word will not be slandered, right? Okay, so you've got biblical ethics. The Bible does not go beyond that, but the Bible provides us with some viruses that eventually will break slavery. And it took another 1800 years for that to happen, but it did. Okay, the ultimate ethics was no slavery. So, another example. Oh, I've got questions here before. So let me ask you this. Is the movement in the Bible complete as far as slavery is concerned? 
It is complete? It's the, does the Bible provide us with complete? No, it doesn't. But the Bible gives us viruses that will eventually destroy the system. This is all based on Ellen White, so hang on with me, I'll show it to you. Okay. Does the issue of slavery as portrayed in the Bible represent the best possible ethical situation? No, it does not. It's obviously the Bible will allow us to go beyond, be, beyond there as it happened eventually in the issue of slavery. So since we see movement from better to better in the Bible, we can legitimately expect that God would want us to move towards ultimate ethics that is only hinted at in the Bible. Would you agree? The Bible just gives us hints, viruses, but then the Bible wants us to go beyond. The Bible, the God wants us to beyond. But if God, imagine what would happen if, if God, his apostle started speaking in slavery. Paul said the gospel would be slandered. Because the whole idea would be that the, the, whole, that the societal order would be under pressure and it would be a problem and people would fight on social issues rather than speak about the gospel. So Paul is not wanting to destroy the system, even though he knew it was wrong. But he gave us viruses, okay, that eventually will destroy this. So, another example. You've got two people reading the Bible approaching the Bible once again from a perspective of 2,000 years. This guy reads the Bible and this is, this, he would represent the modern feminists. They reject the Bible altogether because Paul was misogynist. Paul was bad. He didn't like women. He, that is all crazy. It's not true. But he reads the Bible and says, okay, women can't speak in church. Ooh, women have to have head covering. Ooh, women will never have authority over men. Ooh, and the guy says, this is restrictive. This is terrible. You know, I used to read Paul like this. I used to read Paul like that. I thought, oh, Paul, he, he must have not liked women. You know, I, I had this, yeah. and then I understood that if you were a first century woman, what Paul wrote about women was revolutionary. It was like a, like a huge revolution, you know. Uh, some years ago, I attended a Hurva synagogue in Jerusalem. It was just opened in 2002, uh, and I was, uh, not a little bit later, but I was visiting in 2012. It was rebuilt after the uh, Six Day War or something, and a beautiful synagogue. So it's, a, it's a, as big a place as this, with chairs, with rows, and only men are on the floor. No women are present at all. Okay, zero women. So I sat down, it was Sabbath morning, I sat down hoping to have a very nice worship service with the Jewish brothers and sisters. There were no sisters, they were just Jewish brothers. I did not understand a thing. You know, zero. Okay, it was... It was like the most weird service I've ever been to. Uh, nobody came up and made announcements. Nobody started with prayer. They just one person started singing, another person started singing. They started waving, moving. One person got up and lifted something. Then they sat down. Another person came to front, brought something there, took this, took there, whatever. And then the service was over. Without prayer, without ending, people started going home. I was like, What's going on? Did I experience worship service or what? It was really weird. But I noticed one thing. There were about 200 men. There were no women at all. But they were there. Okay. I only found out where women are uh, by guess. Okay. Because I, I was sitting there somewhere in the, by the end of the service, some lollies started flying from the end from into the congregation. It was a really funny thing. People were getting hit in the head and so on. But it's apparently Jewish custom at the end of worship that women hidden somewhere behind and a whole wall hidden behind some uh, lattice or something. They threw the lollies at men down below worshiping. So they were there except they were not allowed to worship together with men. Okay, so uh, another example at the Welling Wall, there's a division where there's a section for women and a section for men. They are not allowed to worship at the wall on Friday nights together, but it was quite an experience. But when Paul comes, when Paul comes, you know, he is doing weird stuff. He says, women, you were not allowed to sit with your husband, but now come to church, but just be quiet. But, but it's revolutionary that woman was allowed to sit with a man in the same pew. That was revolutionary. That was completely against the social norms because women were not allowed in the same place as men, you know. Uh, and we've got those things over and over in Scripture. And when women were reading the fact that, that Jesus 
talk to a woman at the well. This was unheard of. This was, look what Jesus is doing. He's speaking to a woman at the well at midday where everybody is sleeping. He's not breaking cultural norms. He's not speaking publicly with a woman on the marketplace where everybody can see because that would be bad. That would diminish his reputation. So he catches the woman at the moment when she's alone and nobody, not even disciples are there. Okay? She talks to the woman. He breaks a cardinal rule of their society. Cardinal rule of their society. He allows woman talk to the woman and then sends her as a missionary. And the disciples come and what, what is their reaction? They were astounded. They were astonished. And Jesus is so excited that he says, I've got other food. Don't worry about the food you're bringing. This is too exciting, you know. And the woman becomes a missionary. Uh, another example is that there's often people often say I, I hear people often say if jesus wanted women in ministry he would have a woman disciple oh man do, would you do you know what would happen if jesus chose some women as his disciples that would be absolute social scandal there were no women disciples uh, rabbis not only were not allowed to talk to women women were not allowed to be taught torah to teach Torah to women, you know what Torah is, Torah is the first, first five books of the Bible. <coughs> to teach Torah to women was an abomination. That rabbi was, would be completely dismissed and nobody would want to listen to him. So if Jesus chose five, six women and six men, that would be so antisocial that his message that he wanted to say would disappear in a scandal. But Jesus does something. He surrounds himself with women, he talks to women, and guess what he does? Abomination. He teaches Torah to Mary. But where does he do it? Where, where is it? Where does the teaching happen? It happens at home. Why does it happen at home? Because culture did not allow it. Jesus was sensitive culturally very sensitive culturally okay so you see what's happening so this woman from first century she was reading the bible and she's saying this is wonderful this is 10 times better than what i have been experiencing because women were on the level of dogs in the time of jesus there were nothing a woman could not be a witness to a major event because nobody would believe okay and guess whom jesus chooses as a witness of major event mary this is hugely significant. Mary becomes the first evangelist of resurrection. And guess what the disciples do when they hear uh, Mary's message? They say, women stalk. Women can't be a witness and they have to check it themselves, okay? So here you are. A woman could not be a witness. So women and children and dogs were just about the same level. And Paul, in his writings, actually is not a misogynist. He raises women. He brings women to, to a level of disciples. He's got women disciples, with many women disciples, who follow him and support him financially. And Jesus allows that. This is crazy. A master rabbi could never do that if he wanted to retain his, his status. So Jesus does it privately. Because otherwise his message would be slandered. That's exactly what happened. So, so here we've got uh, the situation. The women are nothing in that culture. And Bible makes it better for women. Look what Paul does with Lydia. Paul is a rabbi. He goes to the river to worship. And he meets a woman. And he talks to a woman. This is a big no-no. And yet... Look what's happened. Lydia becomes a leader of the household church, house church in that city. Okay? So, but still, Paul does not want, don't go too far because, because the gospel will be slandered. So, but the Bible, uh, we're almost done, okay? The Bible gives us a lot of invitations. Okay, the system is not perfect in the time of the Bible, but break it one day. The Bible actually allows us to do this. And eventually the situation of women has improved it's much better than it used to be in a situation and we're still a ways from it as a church we are not the we automatic automatic ethics when women are created in the image of god and should be equal partnership ministry should be we have not reached that yet 
Okay, so the question is, here we've got the static versus dynamic. So the same situation here as far as slavery is concerned, we've got the same situation as far as women's situation in the, uh, in the New Testament and present. So a couple of questions. Is the movement in the Bible complete as far as women are concerned? Well, obviously no. Today women do not wear head coverings. In Jesus' times, or Paul times, if women wear uh, just hair and no head coverings, it would be a scandal. Okay, and women were restricted in some way. Does the situation of women as portrayed in the Bible represent the best possible ethical situation? And the answer is no. It wasn't because we have different different things that women were allowed to do, and uh, and it would develop in the future. And we're still working with this. Oh, I've got the last question there. Since we see the movement from bed to bed in the Bible, can we legitimately expect that God would want us to move beyond towards the ultimate Edenic, I would say, Garden of Eden ethics that is only hinted at at the Bible? And my answer is yes. All of that you have seen so far is my thinking based on one quotation from Ellen White. Okay, and the quotation is right here. It was not the Apostles' work to overturn arbitrarily or suddenly the established order of society. We could say it was not Jesus' work to overturn arbitrarily and suddenly the established order of society. An established order of society was that slavery was just a normal thing in a society and that women should not be a disciples. It was impossible. To attempt this means to arbitrarily overturn would be to prevent the success of what? Of the gospel. If, if Jesus and the apostles would overturn the, the order of a society completely, they would be social revolutionaries, but they would not be preaching the gospel. Okay? So it was not the, uh, the success would be prevented in preaching the gospel. But listen to this. But he taught principles, viruses. Those little viruses that we discovered. He taught principles which struck at the very foundation of slavery and which, if carried into effect, would surely undermine the whole system. So you have an uh, explanation. So everything that I taught you in the second hour is based on, on this, this, uh, this passage here. So we've got that movement in the Bible from, uh, from uh, bad ethics into better ethics as far as slavery is concerned. Ultimately, the principles were going to destroy the whole system. And I believe that God is in the process of creating equality in ministry on the same basis, on the same foundation. And uh, I would leave you with this. This is Acts of Apostles 4.59. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and uh, you gained some, some things, that you, some knowledge that you may not have had before. Yeah. So, okay, we can talk about some, some things. Yes? I want to let you know something in the Bible in Spanish. I was telling you what you were talking about in my Bible in Spanish and the Bible in English. In our Bible, it doesn't say a slave, it says servant. Yeah, but this, the word is doulos. That's an interesting point that you're raising. Yeah, the word is not the same meaning. That's right. Really the same meaning. Exactly. But, but you see, most, uh, most translations don't like the word slave uh, because it's so bad. So they put it servant. But in Greek, it's slave. The original is slave. The original is slave, yes. In, in Hebrew and in Greek. Okay, so translation is, sounds much better, you know, but, but you know what, let me, just, let me just give you an example. Philippians 2, which is the, the most fascinating passage, is one of my absolutely favorite passages in the Bible. Philippians chapter 2, listen to this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, okay, right? We should be the same. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. No, it doesn't take servant here. It says slave in Greek, doulos, a slave. So Jesus took the very nature of slave and he tells us we need to have the same attitude. The same attitude. You got it right here. So God called each one of us to be slaves of other people in the church. That's the true community where we serve one another as slaves. This is actually in, the, in Galatians. Serve one another in sla as slaves of one another. 
Okay, so, so, and this is a completely different picture as far as what the Bible pre presents to us, to, to what we think, okay, because of all of this here. All right, any other questions? There are servants, right? Yeah, servants and slaves is, is used the same thing. It's used as an equivalent in the scriptures. Meeting. So today's meeting is not related necessarily to the Reformation, but also it is in a way, because we talked about sola scriptura. And when you talk about reading the Bible, and when we arrive at the different conclusions by reading the same Bible, we, there's an issue how we read the Bibles. And that was an issue of the Reformation. So it is related to Reformation in some way. It's a little bit different topic on hermeneutics, but it's related to the issue of sola scriptura. That uh, in fact, in fact, uh, let me just show you something that will bring this all back. This is my first slide right here. Okay, you've got this. And what is this? Where does this come from? It's the Reformation. Okay, so, and, and this, the Holy Scriptures, Old New Testament, written by the Word of God, given by divine inspiration through holy men of God, who spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is all Reformation. All Reformation. We began with Reformation, and we ended with the Reformation. Okay, and I've got another quote that I can show you. When the practices of the people do not come in conflict with the law of God, you may conform to them. If the workers fail to do this, they will not only hinder their own work, but they will place stumbling blocks in the way of those for whom they labor and hinder them from accepting the truth. So, another quote that uh, supporting what I was teaching. So, in any case, uh, what I presented to you, and the next lecture would be very, even more would go into Ellen White. So, not just one passage, but there's a, lots of witness from Ellen White supporting this kind of thinking. So, once again, I do not support women's ordination, I do not support men's ordination. That's my position. I, if I could ask a, another question. Mm -hmm. uh, to this day, uh, one of the more public reasons that, that uh, fairly rabid atheists uh, have pushed back against Christianity and mocked it, etc., is because of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, they yes. bring this up, you know, whether... Uh, uh, slavery and hell. Slavery and hell, yes, I've heard, I've, uh, I've heard a whole lot on hell, but I have no doubt that it's there. Yeah, it's a lot, and yeah. Is there a, a reasonably... Is there an elevator length speech? <laughs> uh, is there 60 seconds worth of something? Because when I think about refuting the claim, the claim from, uh, well, I don't, you know, Christianity is a complete farce because, you know, you believe you can own people, but you can defend slavery from the bottom. Yes. Mm -hmm. And immediately I think of about 35 minutes worth of material that if we could just sit down, we could work this out. Yes. But usually we don't get that time. Correct. Is there a shorthand answer? Something a little briefer? As, as far as slavery is concerned, <coughs> well, I have published in Adventist Review last year on October 20 an article on that issue, very brief article that actually speaks to, to that issue. So, so it's a brief version of my larger article on that issue of slavery. So, yeah. Okay, yes. And you, you had it. Recently, when they were having the meetings and discussions for women's ordination, one of the things that we found online, and we also um, saw some video, I guess, on it, is that you have to question everything that was published there. Because some people were publishing things that were not correct. at all. That is and correct. They were even questioning Ted Wilson about that. Yes. Where did these come from? Give us evidence where this came from. <coughs> that is correct. So it's like with anything today, we have to question it if it's true. We do. If it's not true. And, you know, I don't see you as a person that's standing there that's going to tell us falsehoods, you know, and, and, um, and then claim at the same time you see, that you have Jesus. Yeah. You know, I just don't see uh, And this is, this is correct. Uh, the same material that I presented to you this afternoon, 
and this evening, no, this, this, this evening is a new material, but in the afternoon I presented to Theology of Orientation Study Committee. I did arrive at the position uh, that while ordination was a good thing in our church at the beginning, and this is my personal opinion, okay? I'm not claiming that this is what should, the church should do, but that's what I believe with my, all of my heart that ordination was necessary that, by the way, you, you know that, you probably don't know this, that Joseph Bates and James White were never ordained Adventist pastors. Did you know that? Joseph Bates and, and, uh, Joseph Bates and James White were never ordained Adventist pastors. They were ordained in a previous, uh, previous denominations and they came in as ordained pastors and Ellen White carried ordained pastors' credentials. Hands were never laid on her, but she was listed for many, many, many years as an ordained pastor. Okay, so you've got this kind of situation. And uh, I believe, that this is the basic story of Adventism. Uh, but let me ask you this question, logical question. When, when you get a, into a car and you press the gas pedal on the freeway, okay, and you push hard, and hard to, what is the whole purpose of pushing the uh, pushing the pedal uh, of the of gas what is the purpose of it okay. to get the car going right to get the car going but at some point you need to release it because if you don't you are going to have an accident so same with the issues of organization same issue issues of ordination uh, i believe that pioneers such as james white and joseph Bate and ellen white were pushing for organization very hard just like pushing that gas pedal because there was such a huge opposition to it adventists did not want to have anything to do with ordination but they pushed it because they wanted to establish ordination but if they kept pushing 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 we become institutional church and there's no it's just terrible okay just all organization and everything so at some point you need to take your uh, foot off the pedal uh, of gas and kind of coast in a way okay and sometimes you have to put the brake and say hey we're becoming too institutional and in my opinion we are becoming too institutional at this moment we operating policy and policy is the most important thing and policy is more important than anything else okay and in my personal opinion this is my opinion once again I came to a conclusion that we should stop ordaining people and to this end to fulfill what I really believe should happen I handed in my ordination credentials to the general conference two years ago uh, I asked to be commissioned rather than ordained and uh, eight of my colleagues from the seminary did the same. We kindly asked General Conference because Andrews University is a general conference institution so my credentials come from general conference. We s each one of us sent letters, please take away our ordinations and they did not because there's no policy to take ordinations. We tried and tried and tried and just, they just would not. But I'm commissioned pastor, I'm not ordained pastor in my own heart. Okay, so yes, Shane. One of the questions that I think comes up with regard to uh, women in ministry, if, if we set aside the, the issue of ordination for the moment, we simply talk about women being involved yeah. in the same capacity as, as men. Yes. The Bible does talk about, uh, and we've chatted about it very briefly, uh, of the idea that at the fall there was. Uh, the, in Genesis 3, when it says your husband will rule over you. And then clarification certainly comes in many places, no, most notably Ephesians 5, where with that, mm -hmm. what that what that looks like is mm -hmm. the sacrificial service. Yes. So if there is, however, a, a, a leadership role for a husband in a home, that is a servant leadership mm -hmm. role, but a leadership role mm -hmm. for the there I, I heard, I've heard a number of people say, how then can it be that a woman could be in a position of leadership in the church? Mm -hmm. And it, in other words, how, how can you get the two leadership roles not to uh, uh, impact one another and conflict with one another? That's the question I often hear, and I'm curious what your thoughts are. There is another presentation that I have on that issue that we won't go tonight. I need, I'll need to go home. I have a all. I have a presentation. Okay, but I'll let you know this in very briefly. It is. Um, I do not have a problem with husband's headship in the home. It is a sacrificial headship. It is dying for my family, killing my ego, dying for my family. 
but the principle carries on to the church but not male headship a male headship cannot occur in the church because any form of male headship or female headship for that matter usurps the headship of Christ in Catholic Church we've got male headship and male headship came in through the writings of Cyprian and others and this is what the Reformation tried to destroy them come on don't do this okay we tried to get away from this and we are children of the Reformation and we do not have headship in the church because that takes away from headship of Christ so the principle of sacrificial leadership carries everywhere okay this is with my children this is with my students this is with my pastoring this is with my anywhere okay with my department the principle of sacrificial carries over but not the principle of headship that stays with marriage alone and um, it, it's illegitimate to to do this because when you do this then church goes into apostasy because you replace christ as a head of the church with somebody else in headship so if i were to say if I were to sum up what you're saying, if, for instance, a female elder were to make a decision that was over, that it was forcing her husband to do something against his will, that that is wrong. You would not say that this is an issue of a husband's headship. You would say this is an issue of abuse of authority, authority in the church. In the yes, church. correct. Okay. <coughs> Absolutely. Because that kind of authority should not be ever used in the church, ever. By men or women. By men or women. Nobody should have the authority over somebody else. <coughs> then this is why I oppose women's ordination. Because for many people, the, the, the idea is that women should have the power over men. No, I say, absolutely. If you have this idea of ordination, we need to get rid of it. Nobody should have power over anybody, as you had seen in my last presentation. It just does not belong in the church, this kind of hierarchical kind of thinking. So if we're going to introduce women's ordination to the system where women are over men and hierarchical situation, I don't want it. So if I, if I could sum up, and I'll shut up. So if yep, I could, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. If I could sum it up, then it is not that the church does not have authority, but are you saying then that if there is authority, let me just use an extreme case. For instance, in the case of church discipline, yeah. if a member is removed, uh -huh. it, it, is, it is a result of the body. Of the body, and that's... As opposed to correct. an elder or a correct. Pastor, female or male. Correct. Our church is organized in such a way that one person never has a final voice. It's notice what in, in the issues of uh, discipline, it's always the church business meeting that has a final voice. Not the pastor, not the, not the church board, it's a business meeting as a whole. This whole church makes those decisions. And I think this is a very wise thing, that one person never makes the final decision. It's a great design that we need to keep in our churches. That's, that's important, yes? Thank you. But today you presented that there are only two texts in Acts about laying hands. Mm -hmm. Why you didn't bring on hands 1 Timothy 5.22? Lay hands suddenly on no man, sure. neither be partaker of the other's man's sin. This is not but what does it mean? Kind of ordination? No, we don't know. Preaching, what's we don't know. I acknowledge, actually, yeah, correct. I acknowledge that verse in my presentation this afternoon, but nobody really knows. There are no agreement anywhere what this really means. What, what is Paul? What's laying on of hands? Because that laying on of hands goes hand in hand. In that passage that you quoted, the preceding is about baptism. So laying hands, hands was practiced after baptism too. We don't do that necessarily, okay? But they did it in early church. So that particular verse, there's no certainty what kind of laying on of hands we're talking about. So, uh, so you, we just don't know what Paul was talking about. Uh, but I did list that verse in the listings that I've had about the reception of the Holy Spirit and so on. Okay, you had a question too. Yeah. Uh, and we'll finish after this.
it seemed to me that the easy way to resolve this ordination thing is to get away with it. Uh, that's my opinion, but I may be wrong. And I understand that the, the, the Norwegian Union did away with it. I love what they did. <laughs> yeah, so, so this solved that problem pretty Correct. easy. Is there any other people around the world that have done the same thing? Sweden and Denmark. Oh, they both did it. Yes. What, what was his comment? Uh, that uh, Norwegian Union has decided not to ordain anybody. And I think this is probably the best option. The word ordination, the whole, the whole right has been associated with power, with authority, unhealthy view of authority. And I think we need to go back to the New Testament and really do a blessing rather than investing people with unhealthy ideas of power. That's, that's my opinion. But once again, this is my opinion. I hope that you can get something out of this, you can use it, you can think about it, but I'm not standing here as an authoritative voice, you know, that you must do what I say. This is just initiating a discussion. I'm not forcing my views on anybody. This is our last meeting. Last meeting. <laughs> I think I've, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, can you say amen? Please. Amen. Yeah.